For over 20 years, Halo has been one of the core foundations of the Xbox brand, and it's to the surprise of nobody that during that time it's seen a fair share of game releases and extensive marketing and advertisement campaigns to accompany them. One thing that always seems to be a constant, despite the development teams behind the games, are the live-action trailers, some of which went on to win awards, and others promised an even better story than what we got in the games. These trailers were so successful that it eventually led to the creation of multiple live-action series based in the Halo universe, to varying degrees of success. And even before that, a blockbuster feature film with Sir Peter Jackson at the helm. This is the history of Halo in live action. Hello there guys, girls, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Leap Blood, and you thought Halo Revisited was only going to be about vehicles? Nah, uh, 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 uh. nah, alright, episode 3, we're coming out swinging, and I thought it was only fitting on the lead up to the Paramount Plus Halo series that we talk about Halo's history in live action, as there is a very long and complicated relationship of live action adaptations for this franchise that started in a bit of an unexpected way. The year is 2002, and Joseph Staten, one of the staff writers at Bungie and director for cinematics, along with Marty O'Donnell, Bungie's then audio director and lead composer, had just seen the film 28 days later. The two of them pondered the question of a Halo movie, to which O'Donnell suggested that Alex Garland, the writer of the film that they had just watched, would be all over the concept of the Flood. This tiny, meaningless spark of an idea at the time, in a seemingly random conversation, would eventually snowball into something much, much larger. In 2005, barely even a year after the release of Halo 2, and following on from numerous negotiations with Microsoft that involved sending groups of people dressed up in Master Chief costumes to production companies with copies of the script, starting with Columbia Pictures and eventually moving over to a partnership deal between Universal and 20th Century Fox, Peter Jackson was signed on as the executive producer of a live-action Halo movie, with a then-up-and-coming director, Neil Blomkamp, slated to direct the project. Joe Staten was flown down to New Zealand numerous times to meet with Jackson at Weta Workshop to discuss the project, even getting so far as to have designs for the elites, prophets, flood infection forms, sculpted, molded, and ready to go, and even certain weapons and vehicles. The first treatment of a script written by Alex Garland of 28 Days Later fame was loosely based off the first Halo game, following similar story beats but with more personal moments, focusing on Chief's downtime between the missions we see in Combat Evolved, flashback scenes to the fall of Reach, and a setup for a potential sequel. The film was announced. To say how excited I am to be an executive producer on the Halo movie. The world was keen, and then. nothing. Both Fox and Universal pulled out of the project, and whatever was left over from Halo eventually became District 9, and the idea of a movie involving Halo eventually moved to a spin-off game called Halo Chronicles, which was so ridiculous it could honestly be a video of its own, and that led to nothing at all, unfortunately. Or did it? Halo Landfall was a series of short videos created by Blomkamp, starting with Arms Race, that was released on Bungie.net in July of 2007, witnessing a side of the Halo universe that we don't normally see. This short takes place on Mars, the home of Mizraya Armories, the manufacturer of many pieces of weaponry for the UNSC, most notably the Assault Rifle. This video was more of a test than anything else, and didn't have an awful lot of plot going on. The two subsequent installments, Combat and Last One Standing, follow two ODSTs fighting through a battlefield occupied by the Covenant to try and identify the position of the Master Chief as he falls back into Earth's atmosphere, bridging the gap between the end of Halo 2 and the start of Halo 3 where he's found by Sergeant Johnson. These shorts have all the trademarks of a Blomkamp production. The grounded, gritty feel, the shaky cam, the use of practical cameras like the drone that watches over the ODSTs, and a little bit of blood and gore. The attention to detail for the props is incredible, and I wouldn't expect anything less from Weta Workshop. And the Warthog, some of the marine armor sets, and even a few of the weapons like the battle rifle are currently held in the Weta Workshop Museum in Wellington, New Zealand. And I know 
because I've been there. It's likely the closest we'll ever get to the cancelled Blomkamp Jackson Halo movie, and for the seven minutes of runtime that it occupies, this is probably my favourite take on Halo in a live-action setting, and I think might have subtly influenced Halo Reach's more tactical and grounded betrayal of the Halo universe. As if Halo 3's marketing wasn't good enough already, we then got the Believe marketing campaign. Produced by New Deal Studios, this series of videos spanned from TV advertisements to websites which are now, unfortunately, not accessible. The videos from this campaign take place decades after the events of Halo 3 and recount the perspectives of different soldiers who fought alongside the Master Chief during the Human Covenant War. We hear stories of a soldier who kept his faith as he knew that the Master Chief was still in the fight, or of a Marine squad that were hunted during the Black of Night by the Covenant, two veterans of the war going to the Museum of Humanity, coming face to face with a weapon used by their enemies, and returning to the location of a battle with the Master Chief's empty grave. To cap this all off, however, was Diorama, backed by Chopin's Raindrop Prelude, a haunting track that works perfectly alongside the scenes of destruction and chaos that were shown. Each of these videos are incredible slices of the Halo universe, and I've always loved these interviews as they feel like reflections of us, the Halo community. The way Sergeant Navarro says, I just a shotgun. Feels like the kind of enthusiastic response an old veteran Halo player would give when reminiscing on his days of playing multiplayer. The various stories surrounding the Master Chief paint him, and us by extension, as a legend. Something mythical and more than just a dude in a suit of armor. While there are some debates on the canonicity of these videos within Halo's greater timeline, I don't think it detracts from what is otherwise one of, if not the best marketing campaigns for a video game ever. Halo 3 ODST, despite being a spin-off game, still got the live-action trailer treatment. The life, or what's frequently referred to as We Are ODST, shows a very bleak part of the Halo universe, looking on the other side of the spectrum from the legendary status of Master Chief to the hardship and turmoil of being an orbital drop shock trooper. In this short two and a half minute trailer, we get the full career of a soldier joining the Hell Jumpers crammed into an intense montage. From the initial loss of a loved one at a funeral, to signing up to the military and undergoing vigorous training, jumping into the battlefield in a drop pod to face the Covenant head on, and finally flash forwarding several years later, bringing us full circle with another burial. Directed by Rupert Sanders, who's likely best known for his work on the live-action Ghost in a Shell film or the weird Snow White adaptation with Thor, it's in a similar style to Landfall, once again utilising lots of shaky cam to simulate the disorientation and overwhelming feeling of being in the middle of a war zone. This choice was inspired by news footage from places like Afghanistan, helping to take a rather standard sci-fi concept of humans versus aliens and making it feel real. We sometimes forget the soldiers we fight alongside are more than just their armor, and this trailer is a great piece of marketing that I think humanizes the ODSTs prior to the launch of the game, who had up until this point just been fancy marines with cool helmets. Halo Reach was Bungie's last hurrah and goodbye to the franchise they had created, and they pulled out all the stops for the marketing of this game. Starting in April of 2010, Bungie released The Birth of a Spartan, which was, up until that point, the most detailed look we had got at the augmentation process the Spartans underwent, and served as our introduction to the Spartan 3 program and the differences between it and the previous generations of Spartan 2s. Unlike the Twos, who were abducted from their families and replaced with Flash clones that had died fairly soon after, the Spartan Threes were kidnapped as children but were predominantly orphans who had grown up in the earlier years of the Human Covenant War and had lost their parents. These children were vengeful and, more importantly, determined to fulfill that need for vengeance. Our protagonist is seen looking at a holographic photo of his family, something that the previous generations of Spartans were never provided. Noam Moreau, I probably butchered that, was responsible for directing this project and bathes the whole film in this desaturated, muted colour palette that feels very clinical and cold, much like the operating room that our protagonist eventually enters. Fun fact, those electric arms are actually real, provided by our boys at Mitsubishi. with retracting needles too. The augmentation process for the Spartan 3s was known to take several days, so this is a very abbreviated version of that, and oh shit, that's Carter. Okay, that's, that's kind of neat. That's a good way to link it into the game. And here's a fun drinking game for you. Take a shot whenever they use this stock sound effect for a transition. Also directed by Moreau was Deliver Hope. And look, 
who am I kidding? You all know what this trailer is. This, in my opinion, is the next best live action take on Halo since Landfall and follows Kat of Noble Team as she rushes to plant a fiery tactical nuke inside a Covenant cruiser hanging ominously over the landscape of the planet Fumarol, one of the last planets to fall during the final months of the Human Covenant War. Everything about this trailer, and I mean everything about it, is perfect. The first person shots that show Kat's heads up display, the way we see members of Noble Team working together like this brief blink and you'll miss it moment where we cut to Jun whipping out a sniper rifle and taking out this elite ultra, or big man George laying down some covering fire with his machine gun. The Covenant look like they've been pulled straight out of the game and their designs translate beautifully over to live action. Just as it seems as though Kat is making good progress, she is unfortunately hit by a banshee and seriously injured. After which we see Noble Six grabbing the nuke and delivering it to the Covenant cruiser himself, detonating it and unfortunately dying in the process. This trailer not only displays the best of the Halo universe, providing a surprisingly accurate interpretation of a ground battle with the Covenant and showcasing cool aspects of the game like the jetpack and the dynamic between members of Noble Team, but it also acts as a prequel to Reach and shows us how Kat got her artificial arm and more importantly how the previous Noble Six died, vacating the position that you eventually go on to fill. It adds a bit more weight to Carter's line in the first mission of the game. You're stepping into some shoes the rest of the squad would rather leave Unfilled. I'd be hard pressed not to talk about the music in this trailer too, as wow, probably one of the best pieces composed for Halo in any medium, video game, live action, whatever. As of my time recording this video, it's never officially been released, but man does it hit right in the feels. The final live action trailers for Reach were a little bit different than what had come before it. There's no Covenant, not even Spartans for that matter, and instead focuses on normal folks from the planet Reach before the Covenant invaded. Entitled Remember Reach, this series of short videos show a son saying goodbye to her mother before leaving to go off world, the military mobilizing in the streets of Quezon, a couple arguing over whether or not it's worth moving away from their home in Visegrad, three Charlie, a group of marines who are sent to Visegrad after it's knocked offline by the Covenant. There's a feeling of dread that looms over these short clips, which I think is aided by not showing or even mentioning the Covenant, just having them hanging over the lives of these people and knowing that they're likely not going to make it off Reach alive. It's easy to forget sometimes that there is more to the Halo universe than just massive battles, Spartans, and big explosions. There are ordinary people too, and they're the reason we're fighting in the first place. I thought it'd also be worth mentioning the Halo Anniversary Tribute, a short live-action trailer that shows a rousing speech delivered by a commander within the UNSC before launching a living monument to commemorate all the losses from the Human Covenant War. This short clip was made to promote the website halolivingmonument.com, which is now defunct and served as a bit of marketing for Halo Combat Evolved Anniversary and the 10th anniversary of the series. Oh, and um, if you happen to make it this far, why don't you pistol whip those like and sub buttons like they're a sleeping grunt? It goes a long way in helping to get my videos out there, and it's a good morale boost, you know? Anyways, moving on. 343's first foray into the Halo universe with Halo 4 also saw two live-action trailers to accompany it and a five-part miniseries. The first live-action trailer for Halo 4, entitled The Commissioning, does a really good job of setting up the state of humanity after the events of Halo 3, and it seems like humans have finally got their shit together. We're introduced to the UNSC Infinity, humanity's largest ship and home to over 17,000 crew members. Directed by Nikolai Fugs... Uh, oh god, I'm, I've done it again! Ah, oh, I suck at pronouncing things! Directed by Nikolai Fugglesig. That is so wrong. I'm sorry. I know the guy's not watching this video, but I'm still so sorry. This trailer still gives me goosebumps every time I see it. As the Infinity begins to approach the Forerunner Shield world of Requiem, they're scanned by the Didact and pulled into the planet's gravity well as all hell begins to break loose. Parts of the ship hull are damaged and decompressed, sucking members of the crew out into the vacuum of space. The anti-grav generators fail and send vehicles crashing into one another. It just shows the extent of the damage caused to the Infinity before leading into the mission of the same name in Halo 4's campaign. It really plays up the horror aspect of what it'd be like to be in a ship that's for all intents and purposes going down. Normally in Halo, when we're escaping from an exploding ship or something, they cue the epic music, it's all jolly and you're just, you know, walking on through, shooting things and it's a you know it's a great time 
but not here. It, it, it looks awful. Is it a little overdramatic? Sure, but it's still visually incredible with some amazing set design and CG work along with Mark Ralston, who also voices Captain Del Rio in the game, playing him in live action. Just a shame we couldn't have gotten a cheeky Captain Lasky cameo. Just saying. Following on from that, we got Scanned, which is a banger and has some pretty interesting behind the scenes facts. Not only was it produced by David Fincher, Yes, that David Fincher, but was directed by Tim Miller, probably best known for his work on the first Deadpool movie, Terminator Dark, <coughs> yuck, uh, and various DC animated shorts, and of course his company, Blur Studios. Ring any bells? Blur were responsible for all the computer-generated work in this trailer. We start with a CG segment with the didact seemingly interrogating or prompting some kind of vision for Master Chief that shows him before he became a Spartan. On the shores of a beach somewhere in Aridness 2, with his mother calling out his name, glitching out and changing to Cortana for a few moments. We then see John being kidnapped by Oni Spooks, replaced by a Flash clone, then the augmentation procedures for the Spartan 2s shown in grisly fashion, and finally Chief being suited up in what is presumably his first set of Mark 7, no, not Mark 7, what am I, what am I talking, Mark 7, God, Halo Infinite is infiltrating my brain, uh, Mark 4, Mjolnir armor. Flash forward to the present day where John is powering his way through some Promethean Knights, but that's all done with CG, so it's not really what you're here for now, is it? This short, more than any of the others, shows to me just how much you can feasibly get away with by blending live action with photorealistic CGI, the likes of which Blur Studios seem to pride themselves on. If there's anyone who I'd want to see in the director's chair for another shot at a Halo movie other than Blomkamp, it's Tim Miller. And of course, that brings us to Forward Unto Dawn, the first shot Halo took at making a live action series. And you know what? I'm just gonna, I'm gonna come out and say it right now, but I really vibe with Forward Unto Dawn. I understand it's a little boring for the first few episodes and all everyone really wants is to see Chief plow his way through some Covenant in episode 5, but the stuff leading up to that is just as interesting to me. Not only do we get introduced to Thomas Lasky as a character who'd play a pivotal role in Halos 4 and, um... I mean, he was there in Halo 5 and Infinite, so maybe a little less pivotal, but it does an excellent job in showing the Covenant from the perspective of ordinary people. These Marines who are training at Corbulo Academy aren't even aware that the Covenant are real because it's that early in the war. They don't even know what Spartans are either. The whole series builds up to them. We get little sneak peeks and teasers, and eventually when the Covenant do show up, Oh my god, it's the stuff of nightmares. They mercilessly slaughter unnamed soldiers, shooting at a space bridge full of people and seeing their bodies rain down from the sky onto the ground below. It is incredible stuff, and I think shows the ruthlessness of the Covenant perfectly. Chief as well, who was in his Mark IV armor, which was done by Legacy FX, has great attention to detail and matches to how he looks in the Halo Legends short The Package, and dare I say looks better than how Chief appears in the upcoming Halo TV series. The suit is proportionally excellent, and it's a near-perfect translation of the design from the package into live action, like someone had ripped it off the TV screens and put it into real life. Is some of the CGI a bit rough to look at? Yeah. Is the plot a little boring and not exactly what everyone was looking for? Sure, but Forward Unto Dawn to me is still a hell of a lot of fun, and it's, in my opinion, needlessly hated on. And how can you not love a cameo from Frank O'Connor as Beamish the Angry Janitor? It was also around this time we started getting more details on a Halo TV series being produced by Steven Spielberg for Showtime, which, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll get to that. But before we do... Ah, yes. We've come to that part of the video where I get to rag on Halo 5. I've been looking forward to this. Halo 5 once again had an extensive marketing campaign like games before it, with some going so far as to say it was the best thing about Halo 5, as it teased so much stuff that the game unfortunately just never delivered on. Starting with All Hail and the cost, we get to see the rivalry between Master Chief and a newly introduced character, Agent Locke, with both versions of this trailer playing out roughly the same with one major difference. Either Locke is down on the ground and defeated, or it's Chief. These trailers, done by returning director Rupert Sanders, who had previously done We Are ODST, really helped to stoke the flames of many theories and has the audience genuinely wondering who to trust going into Halo 5. Has Chief been led astray and brought humanity to its knees? Or is Agent Locke responsible for the destruction that we're seeing and what looks like the infinity on fire in the distance there? Huh. I wonder if that was planned. 
These trailers are short and sweet with no action, just a few lines of dialogue and a relatively decent looking set of armor for Chief and Locke, even if the actors wearing them do look a bit uncomfortable. It also helped to put the seed in people's minds that this could be the last Halo game to have the Master Chief. Further developing this idea was the trailer A Hero Falls that shows humanity's reaction to the supposed death of the Chief. We see people from all occupations, far and wide, workers in warthog factories, astronauts on the train home or living in the distant reaches of the galaxy. It's a bit of a tearjerker and it's incredibly well shot. Until you start thinking about it some more. The date the Chief apparently died on takes place two years after the events of Halo 5. I'm not sure who overlooked that, I, I mean you'd think they'd have a continuity expert on all the different projects in the Halo universe, but obviously not, and the nail in Chief's coffin was a collapsing building. Right, <laughs> the guy who survived falling from space dies from a bit of rubble. New armor shields are extremely resilient. But wait, there's more. No! Muddying the waters even further was the follow-up trailer The Hunt Begins, which says that Chief isn't actually dead. The official story is that he is, though, from Oni, and it's up to Locke and Fireteam Osiris to hunt him down. Bit all over the place, but on the bright side, we do get to see members of Fireteam Osiris and Blue Team in live action. But otherwise, it's got absolutely nothing to do with the events of the game. Halo 5's marketing being misleading? Wow, I bet you've never heard that one before. And then this rounds off with Halo Night. <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't. I, oh man, I can't talk about this series without laughing because it is so bad. I've been meaning to write a review up about this because it's just, oh man, I could talk for hours about this thing. Releasing exclusively for the Halo Channel app on Xbox, yeah, anyone remember that? Nightfall, like Forward Unto Dawn, was supposed to help flesh out a new character to the Halo universe. Instead of Thomas Lasky, it's focusing on Agent Locke before becoming a Spartan 4. Nightfall has a kind of interesting premise, a chemical weapon that only targets humans has been developed by a Covenant faction, with the main mineral making up the weapon coming from Halo Installation 04, the one destroyed by Master Chief in the first Halo game. Apparently a part of the ring was sent to a different part of the galaxy through... slip space? Uh, okay, I don't think that's how that works, and apparently the chemical used to make this weapon comes from what's left of that chunk of the Halo ring after it exploded. <laughs> Man, you can't make this shit up. I mean, there is a three minute long exposition scene where some random just off the hook comes up with a theory that because the ring got superheated, it made up a new element. I, I, I don't know. So Locke and some other guys go in to nuke the halo ring so the cubbies can't get any more of this mineral, but they get attacked by let golo worms, the same creatures that make up the hunters. Just gonna say it now, but they missed a trick to not make it the flood. The production design is decent and it's competently shot, but otherwise it's just an hour and a half of bad CGI, underwhelming action sequences, and talking. So. Much. Talking. Despite all the talking they do in this film, I honestly still could not give two shits about Locke as a character. It's just bizarre, they went through all this effort to make a whole ass movie for Locke, and it does next to nothing to make his character more interesting for me. I know there are some folks who enjoy Nightfall, but there are also people who enjoy getting their balls stepped on. And both are about as equally painful. Alright, slight departure from the negative opinion I have of Halo 5's associated live action stuff to Halo Wars 2. And these trailers, man, <laughs> whoo, they are something else. Halo Wars 2's marketing kicked off with a cinematic from Blur Studios called Know Your Enemy that is dark and moody. These trailers, on the other hand, are the complete opposite. Playing into the whole strategic thinking and 200 IQ plays of RTS games, these two trailers called The Sail and The Armrest twist otherwise ordinary experiences like buying a 1989 Nissan shitbox from a dodgy 10 foot tall used car dealer no one else, just me? Okay. And trying to get the armrest on an economy flight into a battle of wits between Captain Cutter, played by Gideon Emery in rather unconvincing old man makeup, and the brute warlord Atriox, who is entirely done with practical effects, I should add, which is very impressive. These trailers aren't to be taken seriously, they're just a bit of fun, and I've quoted them more times than I'd care to admit. Halo Infinite's live action trailers feel like they take a lot of inspiration from Halo 3's, from the personal stories shown or in some cases told by each of these videos, even down to the tagline of become being similar to believe. On the lead up to Infinite's release, we got three parts to a series called the official UNSC archives, with each episode providing the story behind a certain aspect of the Master Chief's armor and how it came to be. 
The first episode, Unspoken, follows a marine who, along with another known as David, fought off an ambush from a group of jackals, taking their energy shields back to safe hands, which led to the development of the shielding system for the Mjolnir armor platform. Project Magnus follows an engineer working from home during the height of the Human Covenant War and how she created the grapple shot after many unsuccessful attempts. And Lightbringers observes a group of miners as they send off a rare ore needed to strengthen the exoskeleton of the chief's armor, staying trapped down there in the mine after the Covenant begin to bombard the planet. The performances by each of the actors is phenomenal, and each episode is very well shot, with engaging stories that might not have any sort of action, but help to flesh out the Halo universe in interesting and unforeseen ways. As one commenter pointed out, You know how expensive this gear is, son? Isn't just a reference to the monetary value of Master Chief's armor, but the greater cost in human lives. All these characters shown in these trailers are unnamed, they're likely not given the credit for these accomplishments, we never hear about them in game, but it installs this idea that the Master Chief is the sum of his parts, the culmination of a year's worth of human achievement and invention. He's the best of us all. And finally, we have Forever We Fight, a tribute to the bravery of the human race and how, as a species, we incessantly seem to want to fight all the damn time. Fucking come on, this, this. We're given examples from different parts of the world and different time periods of ordinary folks taking up arms to protect those around them or fighting to overcome insurmountable odds to survive. It then transitions over to a CG section with some decent action showcasing the Master Chief's combat prowess and whoa, 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 hold up a minute. That's a hornet. Hey, yo, 343. I, I, hold up, I'm sorry. Why the hell is that not in the game? That's false advertising right there as far as I'm concerned. If there's one thing that Halo has always done relatively well, it's live action. There have been a few misses over the years, but for the most part, Halo has always translated relatively well from game console to television screen. It only seemed natural for the franchise to make its big break, and eventually, it did. After years of delays, tumultuous development, and a changing of hands from Showtime to Paramount, and I think there was a few others in between there, the Halo TV series is literally just around the corner. Set in an alternate timeline from the one we've known for the past 20 years called the Silver Timeline, the Halo TV series seems to be paving its own path, no doubt with plenty of new and interesting twists and turns that will help to engage a whole new audience of fans. And you can bet that I'm going to be doing a review and a recap of the series once it all winds up. So, what's your favourite live action take on Halo? Do you have high hopes for the new series? And again, if you haven't already, don't forget to like this video and subscribe, alright? I know you haven't done it yet, alright? And there's one small problem with that. I'm hiding in your wall.